the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more well come all you sinners come find god's mercy come to the table and be satisfied taste of the goodness find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that was given, the one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in Him will live forever. Well, bring all your fears, bring your Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that was given. You just heard a very giggly welcome from some of our friends who attended the very first gathering of The Bridge. The Bridge is a new ministry between City Kids and Student Ministry, which is kind of like a crossover for our fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students. Every couple of months, we're going to do something fun outside of church to just get to know each other and gather to hang out. So for our first gathering, we went bowling or so we thought. All the lanes were closed, and so we played arcade games, they taught us TikTok video dances, and we got ice cream, and just had a really great time getting to know each other um, for this age group. And we wanna invite all of our fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders to the next event. So with that, friends, we are glad you are here to worship, where we are an open and inclusive place for all, even our super giggly friends which sometimes includes me too. So with that, let's worship. Good morning and welcome to virtual worship. 
My name's Ashley Hess. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Minister of Youth and Justice. I'm so glad that you're all here with us today, and I hope that you'll take a few moments to say hello to each other in the comments. I have an important task of highlighting three events that we have coming up in the future. My first event is March the 5th at 4 p.m. Our district superintendent, Rick Owen, will be joining us to discuss church polity and doctrine. He will also share with us the current state of the United Methodist Church as we seek to learn all we can about our denomination's potential future. So please join us March the 5th at 4 p.m. in the loft to hear from Rick Owen. My next event is Discovery Weekend, March the 17th through the 19th. This event is for grades 6 through 12. It's for students, and I hope that you're all planning on joining us or your student is planning on joining us. It is going to be an exciting and fun time. I can't list everything that we're going to do, but just know that there will be a lot of laughs and some discussion, but we're going to have a good time. And church family, if you would like to help out, I'm accepting donations of snacks, drinks. I'm also looking for someone to grill on Saturday night. So if that is your calling, please reach out to me by email or contact Peg in the church office and she'll let me know to contact you. But make your plans for Discovery Weekend, March the 17th through the 19th. My last announcement is that we are going to be taking a trip back to the border. So would you join United Methodist Volunteers in Mission and First, uh, First Church for our second trip to McAllen, Texas, along the Mexican border, as we learn about immigration and the lived experiences of refugees? This will include a journey across to the U.S.-Mexico border for a day and time spent with a missionary um, of charity where immigrants come to receive food, showers, clothes, and medicine. The cost will be around $1,000. This will include airfare, transportation, hotels, and some meals while we're there. A deposit of $250 is needed by April the 9th. We hope that you'll consider joining us for this very important educational mission trip to McAllen, Texas.
please join me in a time of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we do not want to be challenged by the cross. We set our minds on human things. We long for the security from our possessions. We prefer our own comfort. Forgive us, we pray. May our sense of self-preservation be disturbed by your son's example, that we might take up his cross in service to the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear these words of assurance. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And she relents from sending calamity in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning. At this time, I invite you all to hear our scripture reading from Psalm 121, and then I will invite you all to pray with me. Hear these words. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade and at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks for today. In the season where we wait, where we prepare, we practice selflessness and patience, God. God, we believe in new birth. We believe in new beginnings and we believe you make all things new. And so God, in the routine of our daily lives, in the chaos of work and stress and just what life is and everything in between. God, we, we ask that we can be reminded and that we can remember that, that that's what we believe in. We believe in new birth. We believe in healing and the resurrection power that you give. And that is new life. And so we cling to that in this season, God. And this morning, we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen.
this morning as we move into a time of giving, we wanted to highlight some of the connectional ministries in our denomination, which our apportionment goes to. These are really big words I just said. Um, and so apportionment is the amount of money that is sent from our church to the conference, and then it goes beyond the conference to the connectional ministry. Now, prior to working in ministry full-time as a kid pastor, I had the honor and the joy to serve and work at United Methodist Volunteers in Mission as for a long time, and then I worked at the United Methodist Children's Home. Both organizations, though separate, and one serves a whole country and the other serves uh, two conferences, um, they both receive apportionment giving. And so I was able to see how our, our giving within the United Methodist Church goes so far beyond, beyond the walls of the church. For example, with United Methodist Volunteers and Mission, UMVIM, they train volunteer teams and they work in connection with global Methodist uh, missionaries all over the world. Dozens of missionaries that are commissioned by the Methodist Connection and sent out to serve all over the world. And missionaries like Brett Thompson, who we serve with in Panama, and we've had a relationship with Brett for many years. And most churches have built similar relationships. And the work that these people are doing in these different countries and around the world, um, it's, not, it's, it's not swooping in and saving the day. They are building lifelong relationships. And so part of our apportionment giving here at First Church supports the bus ministry in Panama. And what is that? That's a great question, glad you asked. It helps transport students back and forth to school every single day. So while we might go for a short Panama learn and serve trip in the summer, our tithing and our giving goes and serves a community and builds relationships with leaders in the community that lasts so much longer than just a year. Our work with the Methodist Children's Home is now called Embrace Alabama Children. Those are children who, for one reason or another, cannot live in the home with which they were born. And so from foster care to group homes to college scholarship homes, it provides a safe space for young children all the way up to college age kids. And then it provides a safety net moving forward um, as they grow up and move out of the Alabama system. And so these connectional ministries, while they might seem confusing or far away, they do so much good work. And even now, after the disaster in Turkey and Syria, UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, has boots on the ground there, and they are working with local leaders to assess what is needed and how Methodists around the world can serve and connect. And so, I hope I helped talk a little bit about a small portion of connectional ministry and how our giving truly does go far beyond the walls of this church, not only with the ministry partners of First Church, but with ministry partners of the United Methodist Big Church denomination. So with that, you are invited to give online. You can mail in a check, but may we joyfully give.
Hi, I'm Stephanie York Arnold and I'm the senior pastor here at First Church. My pronouns are she and her. I'm really glad that you have decided to tune in and join us for virtual worship. The Gospel of John is my favorite gospel because it holds so much mystery. Where other gospels seem designed to give us more factual evidence or carry greater historical significance, I feel John desires to give us more truth. John invites us to see beyond the concrete, hard evidence and instead peer behind the veil, considering the deeper meanings of things. I like the stories that are complex and nuanced, and John is full of them. Therefore, let us consider today's text, which is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God was with him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's impossible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, You're a teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and we testify about what we have seen. But you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except for the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now you are likely very familiar with the second to last verse in this passage, John 3.16. It seems as if everyone knows that verse, and it is many people's favorite, which consequently most of my life made it one of my least favorites. But as I sat to write and I talked with Katie, who had just finished teaching our Wednesday night small groups, one of them was the Gospel of John, we began to imagine that this verse might be so much more than the John 316 monogram stationery and t-shirts that we've seen. Nick comes to Jesus at night, the text says, but what it means is that he came to him in the dark. Physical darkness provides cover for a Pharisee to sneak off who wants to have a conversation with a rebel rouser. But Nick also comes in the darkness of his own imagination and the wideness of his faith. Jesus tries to help him expand his thoughts and to break free from this bondage of seeing only literally, but not figuratively. He talks to him about being reborn. Obviously, this is a metaphor, but Nick gets stuck considering how he might crawl back into the womb. Jesus is befuddled that this guy isn't taking his invitation to sink deeper into the meaning of his words. Jesus asks him how he will understand spiritual things if he can't reimagine wider physical things. Nicodemus, if you can't see that of course I'm not talking about physical rebirth, how are we ever going to talk about salvation, real salvation? 
When Jesus begins to share about Moses lifting up the snake, he's reminding Nick that the Hebrew people had to gaze upon and follow the the very image of the thing that had made them sick. They had to look that truth in the eye to be freed from it and then follow that mysterious path to the promised land which offered them freedom. Similarly, Jesus is to be lifted up so that we might believe in his way for he is the way so that we might follow him, so that we might have freedom and salvation beyond our imagination. And here is my problem with this passage. We have made it one that's transactional. Pray this prayer in this specific way, and God will put your name on a list for eternal salvation, and you're good to go. Once saved, always saved. But this isn't what I think this passage is all about. We have made faith transactional when the divine longed for faith to be transformational. Nicodemus comes being perplexed by the here and now and how what he is following and what he's been taught seems to be in conflict with what Jesus is doing and teaching now. He isn't worried about his eternal salvation. He isn't worried about those sorts of things. He's worried about getting freed up from what is weighing him down right now. Jesus is saying to him, Nicodemus, you've got some shed to shed some layers, my friend. You've got some tightly held beliefs, and you've got to be born again of the Spirit and let her do her work within you to let go. And then you'll have new life and freedom, which is salvation right here, right now. But instead, Nicodemus dreams too small. We who quote this verse often continue to dream too small. In our desperation of the struggle and a desire to have a quick fix, we give up on the here and now and we only fantasize about a better eternity, a future promise to make it to, instead of trying to engage that hope in our present life. We see the destruction and the pain and the brokenness of life today, and instead of sharing that heartache with others who collectively dream of how to remedy and heal it, We stuff it down and push it aside and just thank God that heaven is waiting for us. But friends, Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus that God dreams a bigger dream than just offering us salvation in heaven. God dreams of salvation right here in the present. The divine is concerned with new life today, not just new life tomorrow. Jesus' path that we are to believe in is to look and to follow one who will give us freedom and hope and abundant life today if we but collectively dream and live in loving action together. We have let the dream planted within us of God's kingdom coming on earth and bringing us a new birth die. And we are called to resurrect it. When I wrote this, I couldn't help but hear the song I Dreamed a Dream from Les Mis in my mind. Life had broken Fontaine's dream, and she had lost her ability to hope. She had lost community and the connection that was desperately needed to experience a new birth, to have new life. But that wasn't God's doing or desire. It was the breakdown of the community around her that dreamed too small. She heartbreakingly illustrates in this song what happens when we dream too small in comparison to God and when our dreams die. Her story tells us what happens when we, the people of God, fail to live life believing in Jesus' way of life, which seeks abundant life for all, not just those who society deems good enough or living right enough. So I want to invite you to hear her words and let the music stir within you the awareness in your own life of where you are dreaming too small or letting go of hope, hope in what life is meant to be how it is meant to be heavenly here and now, not just in eternity. Friends, may our dreams of having new life today not die. May we see each moment as an opportunity to be born again, shedding the layers of all that we have clung to, or that have been heaped upon us 
that do not serve us well and do not bring heaven into the here and now today. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join me in our affirmation of faith this morning. As a people full of questions and at times doubt, let us affirm our faith together. We are a people of faith, not just belief. We have faith that God is good and present in all lives. We have faith that there is more than enough for us all to have what we need. We have faith that resurrection is possible in our everyday life. We have faith that the church is the body of Christ redeemed by love. We have faith that all of creation is included in God's redemption. We have faith that forgiveness and generosity are the ways to abundant life. We have faith that we are better together because of our differences. We have faith that what we see is not all there is. We have faith that we can follow Jesus's way of life. We have faith that love wins and darkness does not overcome light. We have faith in the spirit, in each other and in the mystery of life. Amen.
whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to. Walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace, unattached to outcome. Walk in faith, knowing you are never alone. Amen.